if you eat meat only or mostly meat based, if you eat the animals that ate foods and diets with some of the seed oils, some of the corn, that then those animals have higher PUFAs. And so then you are, you know, you'll struggle with the diabetes. All the studies you just mentioned will then continue on with the animals that you're eating. And so therefore we should just eat pasture raised, grass fed. Otherwise we will have higher levels of oxidation, higher levels of PUFAs, and that will then increase our diabetes, how carnivores tend to have higher A1Cs. And then it just furthers that belief of, oh my gosh, my blood sugar is going up. And is it the PUFAs from the chicken and pork? So there's a couple of really important points that you raise there. So first of all, grass-fed meat does have one very important advantage over uh, grain-fed meat, and that's to do with nutrition. So grass-fed meat will have better levels of vitamin K2. It will have better levels of vitamin D. It will have better levels of omega-3. So they've done some very interesting feedlot studies where they've actually taken uh, what they call um, grain finished cattle. So they they spend most of their life on lovely pastures and then they put them in a feedlot eating corn to fatten them up. And they do periodic studies where they uh, take a sample of their meat um, every week or so for the nine month period. And what you can see over a period of months is that you'll end up, you'll start out with a reasonably good level of omega-3 uh, within grass-fed uh, cattle and over a period of time of exclusive grain feeding that omega-3 will turn down to zero. So we know that uh, two-thirds of the brain is fat and about 20 percent of that fat is actually an omega-3, a DHA fat. So omega-3 is really important. So if you're exclusively consuming grain-fed meat then you may be missing out on some nutrients. So yes there is an argument for grass-fed pasture raised meat. However, this whole notion that it's going to be generating oxidation and it's going to be inflammatory and and toxic and all of that, I don't think that bears scientific scrutiny. As long as you're making sure that you're getting your nutrients that you need from other sources and maybe you're having regular salmon for your omega-3 and you're having other saturated fat sources of food that are rich in vitamin D and so on and so forth, then there's no real reason why you must avoid having grain-fed meat. Most of my patients will tolerate grain-fed meat very well, but understanding that it does have some nutritional deficiencies when you compare it to pasture-raised meat. That's the, that's the real reason why you go pasture-raised meat, not because of any you know, potential inflammation. Remember, if the meat isn't rotten, if it's not rancid, then the fats you're consuming are not oxidized. Non-oxidized omega-6 is right. not inherently inflammatory. Right. Remember the Volex study. Arachidonic acid, an omega-6 byproduct, actually increases in states of low inflammatory stress. You also mentioned the HbA1c there and how that tends to be higher or it can be higher in people on a carnivore diet. So here's two things. So first of all, recall that fluctuations and oscillations in blood glucose level are far more damaging than sustained flat elevations. And most of my carnivore patients will demonstrate superb glycemic stability. It might be a 0.2 or 0.4 higher than uh, before they started on average. But if you actually have a look at it, there'll be virtually no excursion. It'll be pancake flat. Number two, using HbA1c often falsely elevates what the average blood sugar is in a carnivore. So let me explain. So you've got a red blood cell and it's sitting in a soup that contains sugar molecules. And over the life of that red blood cell, there'll be a predictable attachment of glucose molecules attaching to that red blood cell. And that will happen in a rather predictable fashion. We say it's three months, but it's it's strongly biased towards the most recent six weeks of the red blood cell lifespan. Now, the obvious factor that will increase the amount of sugar that attaches to a red blood cell over its life is the amount of sugar in the blood. But the other factor that a lot of people don't consider is the lifespan of the blood cell. Now, what causes blood cells to turn over quicker, basically to die and need replacing? Well, oxidative stress is a huge component of that. We know that people that have uh, conditions leading to oxidative stress 
like a G6PD deficiency and things like that, often commonly known as barbism, then they'll have a very short red blood cell lifespan. Their red blood cells will often die. They'll have something called hemolysis. So if you actually reduce oxidative stress, your red blood cells will live for longer. And when you measure the HbA1c, it will appear as your sugar level is higher because basically you're looking at a population of red blood cells that's had more time right. for these glucose molecules to attach to it. And there's actually a way that we can assess this. So, so a reticulocyte is basically a new red blood cell. Um, it's a little bit different to normal red blood cells or mature red blood cells. It contains uh, a, a RNA and a slightly bigger. So we can actually measure the number of reticulocytes in your blood, and that will tell us how many new red blood cells you're making. So if we assume that you're in a steady state with regards to what your actual hemoglobin and your red cell count is, then your reticulocyte count will actually indicate if there's any changes in the rate of turnover. So if your red blood cell number is staying the same and you can see your reticulocyte count, as in the number of new red blood cells that your body's having to generate is falling, that tells you that your red blood cells are living longer. And indeed, when I measure this on a lot of my patients, that is exactly what we see. The red blood cells are living longer and that artificially elevates the HbA1c. How do you test for the reticulocyte? Is it a marker that you can just test through your doctor? Absolutely. Okay. Um, how do I test for it? I write it on the form. <laughs> At the end of the day, wear a continuous glucose monitor. If you're, if you're worried about your HbA1c being too high, then if you wear a continuous glucose monitor, it's a little disc, it just sticks onto the back of your arm, right. then what you'll get is real-time measurements mm -hmm. over a 24-hour period for about two weeks, I think, in the States. I think yes. they, they last for 10 days, but in Australia, they for two weeks and that'll be communicated wirelessly to your phone and that will give you perfect information on the trend of your blood sugar levels you don't always trust the absolute level um, but it's the trend that yes. you're worried about if you understand that variations in the sugar level are what generates the oxidative stress then if you've got a pancake flat trace then you could really care less what your hba1c is